one of the most magnificent pieces of, of or or achievements that the arts can sometimes uh, invite us to have is we actually step outside of ourselves out of our egos and our small concerns into a bigger universe of human concerns this is the awe experience seeing the seeing the planet earth from orbit uh, the blue marble effect this is seeing the grand canyon <music> Well, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter, and welcome again to The Empire Neurologist. So nice to connect with everybody. It's an interesting theme that we are connecting with everyone through this medium. And uh, I would say that we are facing a crisis of disconnection, you know, be it issues going on in our world right now, uh, coming out of the pandemic, et cetera. We are more disconnected and lonely uh, than ever before. And it turns out that loneliness and the sense of being disconnected from others and actually being disconnected has significant medical consequences associated with a variety of medical issues. And we're going to talk about that today. We're actually going to be reviewing this book, Project Unlonely, uh, and it is Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection that I just referred to by Dr. Jeremy Noble. Let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Noble. Dr. Jeremy Noble is a primary care physician, public health practitioner, and award-winning poet with faculty appointments at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. He's the founder and president of the Foundation for Art and Healing, whose signature initiative, Project Unlonely, addressing the personal and public health challenges of loneliness and social isolation, has gained national visibility. That's for sure. It has gained national visibility. And the book uh, that he's just put out is really uh, going to help that happen. And uh, it's certainly not too soon. So let's jump right into our our time with Dr. Noble. Well, Dr. Noble, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be here, David. So what is this all about? I mean, uh, people are lonely. And what does that even mean? And why is it important? Well, you know, loneliness has been with uh, human human history for a long time, David. I think there's a lot of attention to it now because of the recent common experience many of us shared during the pandemic. But it's been tracked, you know, as a public health challenge for several decades and, and increasing. The, the pandemic brought it to light, but there's still many things going on that has increased loneliness and its importance. Well, generally, when we think of loneliness, we have kind of an image of an elderly person sitting in his or her apartment, perhaps in a wheelchair, Uh, kids and grandchildren don't call, don't visit. But this is something, and we should define what loneliness really is, but it is something that can affect anybody, even in their modern go-to-work day, the sense of disconnection. I mean, your subtitle is Healing Our Crisis of Disconnection. It doesn't necessarily just focus on being physically alone and unattended to. That's really an important point for for people to understand, which is being lonely and being alone are not the same thing, although they can relate to each other. So being alone, socially isolated, actually can be harmful to your health, but it also can be such a positive sense of uh, exploring thoughts and feelings in a in a curious and inquiring way that we have a high class word for it. We call it solitude. But being isolated can also be devastating and negative for certain people like older adults, where it robs them of a chance to be in communication and connection with others. But that's still different from loneliness, which is subjective. It's a mood. It's an emotion. It's the gap we that each of us feel between the social connections we would like to have what we aspire to, what we sometimes dream about, and what we actually feel we do have. And I think it's one of the most human of feelings, this desire to have social connections. But when it gets too deep, too chronic, too sustained, it can spiral into some serious physiologic and behavioral changes that are quite bad for our health. And the the lack or the sense of lack of connection, is that generally looked upon for, for some people as threatening? And do they feel threatened in their world when they feel alone? Well, you know, it's a really interesting question. Why, why is it that our brains create this signal, David, that when we don't have the social connections around us, we feel anxious, we feel a little bit ill at ease? And maybe it goes back to early early primitive development, primitive times, you know, you can imagine 20,000 years ago, which is when 
the times we know there were people around. We have cave paintings from, from those ages. And you hear a rustling in the bushes. And you think, I wonder if that's a saber-toothed tiger. And you go to pick up a stick to protect yourself. Don't you want to have 10 people around you also picking up sticks? Of course you do. And so the signal has evolved evolutionarily that we actually feel a little bit distressed when we're not around people or, or around people, but we don't think we can trust them or rely upon them, which is part of why we can be lonely in a crowd, which surprises a lot of people. I think it goes back to those early evolutionary days. The question is, now that so much time has passed, we've learned a lot more about how to control mood and emotions, how to be aware of them, how to navigate them rather than deny them. And I think that is the big potential here for loneliness. Well, I know you call that Gavin DeBaker's book, uh, The Gift of Fear, that there is an upside to this sense of being uh, threatened, or at least being threatened, that you know that's also a part of the nature of being human, that there's an upside in terms of learning and in terms of, of making progress and protecting yourself. So you really make this connection then between how we can leverage the creative arts as a, a channel for reconnection. How do, and, and I think you were talking about that you were visiting uh, children's uh, art display post 9-11. Walk me through where we, how we got to this point. Sure. I mean, I'm a primary care physician and a health practitioner. I also enjoy the creative arts and myself, I am a poet, but this all kind of took me by surprise. It was, as you said, after 9-11, when I was trying to make sense of what was going on, I, I happened to come across some really remarkable drawings, uh, crayon drawings, very simple by, by kids, many of whom were trying to make sense of their own experiences of the of the 9-11 uh, events, which were very traumatic. And these were kids in the five boroughs of New York. And as they were struggling with their their trauma from that and trying to, they were asked by art therapists to draw what was on their mind. And they drew horrific images, planes going to buildings, people falling, falling uh, from those buildings. The kids got better. They got better across race and class. So something was going on in their brains that facilitated this improvement in mood and behavior. And I thought, this is so fascinating. And so that's really when my curiosity got started. And then that led to the development of the Foundation for Art and Healing, a nonprofit almost 20 years old. And the goal there is of that foundation is to ex explore and engage creative arts as a modality to improve health and well-being for individuals and communities, and our work with loneliness has grown out of that initiative. Well, for our viewers, we're going to be interviewing Susan Magsman, who wrote a book called Your Brain on Art, uh, very soon. So that'll be a great, uh, great dovetail with this discussion. So you then uh, created this project uh, much more recently. I think that was, when did the actual uh, Lonely, unloneliness project began. Right. So we've had several names for it. It's now Project Unlonely. It's okay. kind of settled into that name, David. But our, our interest in loneliness, my interest in loneliness actually emerged out of the work we were doing with the arts in trauma. So after 9-11, we started working with active duty service members who were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan with military related trauma. We started realizing trauma was in a lot of other situations. Aging in some ways is traumatic. You lose friends, you lose capabilities, you lose confidence and cognition sometimes. And so uh, one of the tra traumatic groups we worked with were middle-aged black women with low income who had poorly controlled chronic illness, in this case, diabetes. And we were able, we were using these creative expression techniques that we had developed that combined mindfulness and then some creative making and then social conversation in multiple sessions and in just six sessions, each an hour and a half long, we got statistically significant improvement in mental health. But most importantly, a little to our surprise, the women volunteered during the interviews we did that this process not only made them feel less stressed out and more relaxed, no surprise, that's really what we were hoping for, but it also made them feel more connected and less lonely. And that, we started getting that signal around 2012. And as someone familiar with science as you are, you know, when you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you pat yourself on the back, you say, boy, were we smart, and now we go on. And 
But when something surprising and unexpected happens, it actually can be even more interesting. So I started becoming very curious about um, loneliness and was very fortunate to reach out to some of the experts in the field. They were very generous with their time and began to see that loneliness may be more pervasive than I thought and not just a mood state, but it all that, that increased risk for depression and addiction and suicidality. I think that was well understood at that time, but what was just coming to light, David, fascinating research showing that loneliness uh, actually increases risk of physical illness too, as well as shortens lifespan. So it reduces life, you know, or it increases the risk of dying early by 30%, which is very significant. So that's when we decided since we had an intervention that was making people less lonely and since loneliness didn't just make you miserable, but could kill you. And as far as we could tell, it was increasing that Project Unlonely became our major focus and remains our signature initiative, showing how creative expression can engage and connect people. Hey guys, we're going to get right back to the podcast, but I wanted to let you know that today's podcast is being brought to you by our friends at Chef's Foundry. This is the type of cookware that we use at home, nonstick ceramic cookware. You know, a lot of the nonstick cookware that's out there uh, these days is coated with some pretty toxic chemicals, including things like PFAs and PFOAs. And this is ceramic cookware. They have their P600 uh, cookware line. It's highly durable. It resists discoloration. It resists cracking. It's incredibly easy to clean. And again, it's what we're using here at home. And I want to let you know that Chef's Foundry is offering up to a 53% discount uh, on buying their new P600 cookware line. And they're going to give you uh, a, a set of six silicone utensils as well. What you want to do is uh, go to their website, which is chefsfoundry.com, then put in forward slash DR Perlmutter or Dr. Perlmutter, and you can uh, take advantage of this discount. Really incredible cookware. Again, it's what we're using here at home. We're super happy with it. Let's get right back to our podcast. So I want to unpack again um, further this notion that the sense of lon loneliness uh, is associated with increased risk for a, a lot of different issues, metabolic issues, certainly uh, yeah. even mortality. But before that, then how do we actually quantify it? What are the metrics that you're able to apply to the sense of loneliness that then allow you to relate that to risk? So that's a really important question. So epidemiology is one of my backgrounds and you know I got a master's degree in that as part of my public health training and so I started thinking okay well if you want to manage it how do you measure it loneliness is very challenging to measure in part because of its subjective nature you can only know if people are lonely by asking them <laughs> and then they may or may not be able to recall it they may be embarrassed guilty or ashamed and deny it in their response to survey questions so there's a whole art form of how you evaluate loneliness. That's different, by the way, than social isolation, which is objective. You can measure that by frequency and number of human contacts. But still, they're good measures for looking at loneliness. They've been validated over the years. We've work, we're have we working on improving those because, as one thing we might talk about, there are different types of loneliness. And some of the common measures now integrate all of those into a single score. We think it's useful if you tease it out a little bit because different types of loneliness, different types of ways to approach it. But that's still the bottom line of measurement, which is survey. You have to ask people about it, which has all um, the strengths, but also the challenges of that kind of research. Well, you know, it's among scientists, it's always nice to be able to draw these correlations based on looking at the variables. But I think that, you know, if you, for example, look at blue zone uh, information and for our viewers, we're going to be interviewing Dan Buettner, I think next month, but you know, what did he observe? And I think there's great uh, value in a, in a observation. He observed that, you know, what's what there's an association between longevity and disease resistance and being integrated into a community. Now that gets back to your response to a question I just posed, and that is how you metricize the, the notion of uh, loneliness. And the, I think your response indicated that, well, you know, on the one hand, you can, you can find out how many social contacts an individual has during a given period of time. 
But I think the point I'm trying to make is we, we touched upon earlier is that, gosh, people can be living in a big city and going to work and being on the subway and being with and near people day in and day out, and yet still be crippled by the sense of isolation, even in a crowd. I mean, almost, you know, it seems like paradoxical to feel isolated in a crowd. And yet that's part of our modern world. And I think certainly exacerbated by COVID. Absolutely. And it gets to the point I mentioned earlier, David, that there are different types of loneliness. So we're coming up on the holiday season. And I think people, many people, for them, that's the loneliest type of the year. There are at least two types of holiday loneliness, right? So there's the loneliness when no one invites you to a party. But then there's the loneliness when someone invites you to a party and you realize you have nothing in common with people. You don't feel any kind of um, uh, comfort or sense of connection with the people there. That's the so-called lonely in a crowd um, experience. But you can measure that, too. (laughs) The good news about, you know, loneliness measurement is while there are challenges because it's survey related, how you, the, the negative consequences of loneliness actually are proportional to how lonely you feel. So if people are willing to tell you how they feel, it actually is a fairly accurate metric. It's so uh, the subjective nature of it, uh, the feeling part of it is a, you're saying is a good metric and then correlates well with these uh, health risks and Absol- mortality. Risks. Absolutely. And then now that, we know a little bit more about how to measure it, we then can say, what are the physiologic consequences of loneliness? And I know you'll be having Susan Magsamon um, and her book with Ivory Ross, I think is a terrific, you know, kind of guide to how complex um, the, our brain is and how the brains can impact it. Before we talk about what the arts can do to the brain, let's talk about what loneliness does to the brain. Well, it's a distress state. It is stressful, so it increases fight or flight. So we know that that increase of cortisol increases blood pressure, it increases inflammation, and that those processes over time are very injurious to us metabolically. Cardiovascular health is impaired. Cognitive impairment happens at a 40% increased risk, possibly because vascular damage. And so, you know, loneliness is not a neutral experience for our brains, which is all the more reason to understand it. Yeah, I would say for our audience, you know, we've talked so extensively and presented experts in uh, exercise physiology, nutrition, et cetera, on the impacts of those lifestyle choices, sleep, uh, in in terms of those uh, mechanisms that you just described, things like inflammation, uh, vascular uh, functionality, even glucose measures, insulin functionality, gut permeability as compromised by higher levels of cortisol, changes in the microbiome uh, and inflammation as a consequence thereof. But to think about loneliness, I mean, it's something that we don't normally talk about, but now you're relating it to all of these health issues. Can we take a step back on a broader scale and talk about perhaps what are the public health implications then in the United States of what we're talking about right now? Right. Well, you know, if you go to some of the physiologic consequences of loneliness, the Um, American Heart Association came out with a science statement in August 2022, just over a year ago, that loneliness increases risk for heart attack, stroke, or death from either by 30%. Now, a 30% increased risk if something has a 1% prevalence, okay, that's not great. It's a big number. But, you know, if if it's a 30% increase or a 30% attributed risk to something that kills half Americans, cardiovascular death, then it's a huge issue for for public health to understand what causes loneliness, how to reduce the risk that people experience it. And there's some other phenomenon, I think, about loneliness that are different than just stress that are worth talking about from a public health perspective, and and it ties into how we intervene on it. But we'll wait. I'm sure we'll get there in this conversation. Yeah. So so what do we do? Uh, I'm reading your book. I'm feeling really lonely. I'm feeling isolated, disconnected. And, you know, what's the where do I start? What what is what is my outreach then based upon the information presented? What what's a person to do? Right. So um before we can actually kind of talk about the meaningful interventions, let me just very quickly uh, talk about two things. One is 
now how loneliness works we talked a little bit about how it can be a signal and sometimes signals are positive that you need something whether it's thirst being a signal for hydration you know loneliness is a signal you need human cognition so one of the really important things for people to understand is as that fight or flight signal begins to take hold if you don't um respond to it the other thing that loneliness does that stress does not do is it starts changing how you make sense of your social environment so-called social cognition you begin to see risk everywhere this has been well studied so imagine you're in a foreign city strange city at six o'clock at night night's falling you're walking down the street and someone wa is walking towards you your brain on its own is always asking is that person a threat or an opportunity a threat or an opportunity, because that's what our brains are trying to do. They're trying to keep us alive. Friend right. Friend or foe. People who have chronic loneliness start interpreting ambiguous signals, like a person walking towards you, uh, as increasingly likely to interpret it as a threat. They interpret what otherwise would be ambiguous as something that might be threatening. Now, why is that? That's because they may have had earlier experiences. This is part of what's sometimes called post-traumatic stress syndrome where they tend to over-anticipate threat, over-anticipate risk. Now, why is that a problem? Because then they start acting in a way that might look avoidant or even hostile to the other person, who then starts reacting also. And so in a very subtle way, if our brains become lonelier and lonelier, they risk spiraling into being even lonelier because we start altering our social cognition. We see the world as a risky place. We start asking, we start acting fearful and avoidant. The world starts reacting that way, starts saying, okay, pal, if you want to be on your own, be on your own. We start feeling lonelier and lonelier. And this is what I call the loneliness spiral. Well, let me propose something to you that comes to mind. And that is the, the major uh, group of chronic degenerative conditions that are, according to the World Health Organization, the number one cause of death on our planet, cardiovascular disease, cognitive decline, um, uh, various uh, things like diabetes, obesity, et cetera, they're all primarily, one of the mechanisms involved is inflammation. And we know that inflammation tends to uh, compromise the ability of top-down control from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, and in a sense, fans the flame of the response that you just described where things look more threatening than they should. And where I'm going with this is, could it be then that these chronic degenerative conditions, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, et cetera, because they are at their root inflammatory, through the mechanism I just described, then these diseases set the stage for loneliness. And as such, that might be another explanation for the correlation. Uh, absolutely. And I yeah, and I think part of what's tricky here, and this happens in a lot of biological um, um, cycles, as you're well aware, it's uh, the relationship is bi-directional. We've known for years that depression causes diabetes. Now, how could that be true? Well, I think because it, we also know that depression is pro-inflammatory. It increases inflammation. Inflammation, chronic inflammation increases diabetes risk. So we also know that if we have certain behaviors, that, in, you know, so uh, loneliness also is pro-inflammatory. Pro so as you start having more chronic um, or the early symptoms of chronic illness, you can also, or certainly as it becomes more severe, you also isolate. You, you, you become, as Susan Sontag, the great essayist said, you join the, the world of the, of the sick people <laughs> where you're self-isolating, society treats you a little bit differently. If you have a catastrophic illness like cancer, people often avoid you completely for paradoxical reasons, uh, because it makes them feel maybe anxious or nervous about uh, their own risk of becoming yeah, seriously ill. Yeah, and you Ill. wonder if that's not an evolutionary uh, issue in terms of being what's best for the tribe. Well, of course, you know, you might ask that, but we certainly have made progress, right? So how do we not be held hostage to no, evolution? I understand. <laughs> no, no, I, I, you know, it, it certainly is the challenge of evolutionary biology, which is how do we learn from it and begin to um, um, adopt new behaviors that actually may improve health and well-being in the short term? So. Our world is full of uncertainty. Uh, as you and I are having this conversation today, there's a lot going on in the world. Not yeah. that there always uh, isn't something, 
But right now there's quite a bit going on in the Middle East. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. Does that fan the flames of this sense of lack of connection or isolation? I think the general um, sense people have that the world has become unstable, fragile, and at increased risk. This is what Zygmunt Bauman, the philosopher, called liquid modernity, where we can't depend on things as much anymore. I think that that is an, uh, a driver for the increase in loneliness and all the toxicities. I do address that in my book and in the chapter on modernity. Which I think also, that's your second to the last chapter. It is. And it also includes social media, particularly if social media is being used in a performative, comparative way, often by, by younger almost people. always is. That's correct. Um, exactly. And then it's like, well, do I have, you know, you know, does anyone have my back? You know, my likes and followers are going down. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm exposed out here. Well, this, this triggers the fight, flight, lonely cycle in the brain. It starts the acceleration the acceleration of it. I think these are fragile times. That's a very good point, though. I want to go back to that social media. You know, this, we used to call it, uh, you know, if you didn't think you measured up, we call it Snapchat, Snapchat dysmorphia, where your, even your physical features had to measure up to a certain level. And by recommendation, we wrote a book called Brainwash, and it, it, you know, we, we talked about this. We talked about disconnection from a physiologic perspective between this top-down control from the prefrontal cortex, but also disconnection from others and disconnection from nature and how powerfully negative influence, uh, influencing that can be. But the trick I have found is to not look at it. Don't look at your likes and uh, the thumbs up, thumbs down, because there, you know, many people, that's their re raison d'etre is just to be you know, aggressive towards other that, it's their issue. So don't look at it. So what do we do then? So, uh, you know, first, you know, what, what is, uh, I want to get back to that, the answer now in terms of uh, people watching this podcast saying, you know, I do feel kind of isolated. What are you recommending? Where do I go with this? So this is where I have found the power of creative expression and how it works, not just to change our brains, but change our minds and change our behaviors to be so compelling. And that's what we've integrated into our Project on Lonely Programming. Let me, let me give you a, just a quick walkthrough because it's it can get pretty complicated. Let's start on the brain effects, just pure physiologic brain effects. So we've known for a long time that um, making art or even beholding art, right, listening to music and so on, um, reduces cortisol. So it reduces release of stress hormone cortisol, and it increases the levels of the so-called feel-good hormone. So that's serotonin, dopamine, um, you know, endorphins, and oxytocin. Well, hi, everyone. Dr. David Promoter here. Uh, we hope you're enjoying this content. And if you would do so, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're not already a subscriber to our channel, please consider doing so. Uh, we're really grateful to have you as part of our community. So let's get right back to the presentation. So to, just to start with, engaging with the arts makes you uh, more relaxed and in a better mood. So that's not a bad place to begin in terms of connecting with people. But what's been very interesting to me is just in the last few years, some good functional MRI studies show that creative aesthetics so not what color is that painting, but what does that painting mean? If you ask that question, the parts of your brain that get activated overlap what was mapped in 2018 as the social connectome. The regions of the brain, frontal cortex is part of it, but temporal um, activity too, that actually determines what I talked about, uh, like, is the social environment risky or safe for you? And so that's that's really a, a kind of encouraging signal that that may be that one of the reasons why in certain creative experiences, listening to wonderful music and so on, you start feeling a positive mood of not just, you know, endorphin related, but you begin to trust the world. You, you might have a sense of connection in a broader way to other people. This is commonly expressed by people in certain art forms, either making or sharing it. So that's just at the brain level that we're seeing those effects. Now, the other things the art do, which is very, I think, very um, human, is they encourage us to make and share stories. Because a lot of expressive art, whether it's a poem, a painting, um, a dance movement, or even a casserole, <laughs> you know, the culinary art form. Or well done. Very well done. I like that. Or, or gardening. You're expressing a story, something that matters to you that you want to communicate to others which makes some your unique story visible to other people. They can 
see you as a unique individual, relate to you, even if their personal story is different in the details, as all human stories are, the common elements, um, victory, defeat, celebration, despair, these are part of human stories. And you start recognizing each other through the common elements. So that's the that's the second thing the arts do, which is they allow us to find shape and share our, our story so we can connect. And the third, and I think one of the most magnificent pieces of, of or or achievements that the arts can sometimes uh, invite us to have is we actually step outside of ourselves, out of our egos and our small concerns into a bigger universe of human concerns. This is the awe experience, seeing the, seeing the planet Earth from orbit, uh, the blue marble effect. This is seeing the Grand Canyon. And there are some really good experiments done that when people have awe experiences, they're more generous to each other. They're more compassionate. They'll do things in psychological testing um, scenarios, which show that they put themselves second instead of first. The consequences of this for a world that has to lo learn to live together are very significant. I'm thinking we, we, we discussed this uh, so-called awe experience in, in our book, in, in Brainwash, and it is one that, uh, you know, there, there seems to be kind of a trend these days of um, leveraging um, psychedelics in terms of perhaps uh, achieving these types of experiences. Do you want to comment on that? Because it, it, it kind of, you know, one of the things that we hear for when people are, are, are experiencing psychedelics is they feel this connectedness. It's the first thing they seem to say to nature, to the world around them. What are your thoughts? So I'm not an expert in uh, psychedelic medicine. It's a strong interest of mine. And I work with many colleagues, uh, both at Harvard and NYU, where that is their core interest. I wouldn't be at all surprised that when, when we better understand and can map the pathways at a more detailed level of psychedelic activity, that it overlaps significantly with some of the creative arts and creative expression modalities, particularly, you know, the ones that aren't tied to symbolic form. Right. So language gets processed by the language center before it starts activating the amygdala, the hippocampus and so on. But music does not. Music is a pure play to the brain. You know, um, Oliver Sacks, the remarkable neurologist right. storyteller, was an early advisor to our foundation. And he, he said that when you play music for someone, the entire brain lights, lights up on an F fMRI scan. So I think psychedelics and there's whole varieties of them. They don't work the same way. MDMA, so-called, sometimes called ecstasy, molly, and so on. Uh, some people describe it as an empathogen. It literally, you know, kind of seems to make the fear and anxiety we have about social engagement totally dissipate. That's what people report. And single treatments with therapeutic um, coaching have significant rescue rates from significant PTSD, a single treatment. So I think, you know, these these pharmacologic agents, mostly plant derived, as Michael Pollan points out in um, How to Change Your Mind, I think offer some very powerful opportunities, not not just to, um, you know, kind of deal with the anxiety based disorders, um, but to, to give us a another uh, powerful tool to address people who are struggling with various mental challenges. Well, you brought up an interesting uh, a point there. You said res uh, with rescue coaching. And I, I think that's an important point as it relates to people think, well, I'll just do some ketamine or MDMA and, and yeah. hope for the best. So what does that entail? What What is the interaction like if you're going to be in, involved in the clinical application of a psychedelic? Again, I'm, this is not my area, so I'm not suggesting this. This is really just something that... Again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm on a learning curve on, but I think the general thinking around this is that as you use pharmacologic agents to free up certain uh, brain circuitry and, and so on and alters um, kind of the pathways of things like memory and um, impulsiveness and uh, even in, in some ways cognition, then having some kind of external reference point in the form of someone who is attending you through that process is likely to be very helpful. And so I think that is, at least in my opinion, you know, the approach that I think is likely to be more 
um, helpful to people over the long term so that we can better understand if these agents do have the promise they appear to have, how they can be used in as positive uh, a way as positive as possible and avoid any any of the positive the possible negatives. Every powerful um, pharmaceutical agent has risks. And so what you really want to do is understand how to how to negate those risks to the extent possible. I'm thrilled with the potential here. That's for sure. Um, you know, and thinking about this uh, stigmatization over decades, and now sort of the fact that we can re-embrace the potential here that was brought to our attention in the late '60s, uh, we'll see where it goes. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, especially in your world, especially as it relates to the feeling of isolation and disconnection uh, when you're hearing. You know, that the number one, in my opinion, when you talk to people who experience this is they feel connected and uh, gee, who, who's going to argue with that? Let me move on to the notion of definition of loneliness or sense of disconnection as it relates to what is culturally, how does it relate to various cultural differences? In other words, here in America, we could get to a sense of deep loneliness and feeling isolated versus other cultures where perhaps they're more stoic or it's not looked upon or stigmatized as much to have these feelings. What is your sense? My sense is it is very culturally dependent. And, you know, Butner's work obviously looks at cultures where social connection is fundamentally integrated into the cultural assumptions. I've been told by some people, you know, um, medical anthropologists, linguistic anthropologists, that there's some cultures where they don't even have the word for loneliness, where the, mm. the collective psyche is so strong that that is how people organize uh, themselves and their social cognition. But if you look at the, the U.S. culture, this is the book Bob Putnam wrote in 2004 or six, I think, uh, Bowling Alone, where he talks about the psyche, the American psyche of autonomy and independence. And I, I'm sure there's some positive social benefits of that, but I think it also runs the risk of, um, a, of separating us and, um, and not, a, not promoting social connection as a, a valued societal goal. Now, I think the pendulum has slowly moved in that direction. I don't think it's just because of the increased awareness of the health risks, right? That, you know, you publish studies and so on. I think people feel better when they're connected and not just to other people, but to themselves. And I, you know, there's a whole kind of exploration of that, whether you achieve that through meditation, creative expression can be a pathway for that kind of mindfulness. But I think it's very hard to have sustained, authentic connections with other people if you're not comfortable with yourself, who you are, what matters to you, where you fit into the world, mission, purpose, these kinds of things. And I'm actually delighted to see some of the younger generations be so focused on that and trying to make sure their lives have meaning and purpose, where you could argue not too many generations ago, a lot of what success was defined by by many people in our culture was externalities you know, material achievement, uh, sure. you know, did you have, you know, the two and a half kids, a dog and a picket fence, white picket fence around your yard. I mean, I think we're moving away from that. And I think, um, I think that opens up a lot of possibilities for creativity and um, embracing the diversity people really feel in, in connecting with themselves and others. Well, your message and mission are clear. Uh, what's your biggest challenge moving forward? You know, I, well, thank you you know, for that question, you know, the real challenge is the adoption rate with which people are willing to kind of open their curiosities a little bit about what is loneliness, what is connection. It's still a stigmatized word to say you're lonely. You know, the three goals of Project Unlonely is first to increase awareness of loneliness and its health risks, its toxicities. I feel an obligation to do that both as a, a, a physician, as a public health practitioner. But the second goal is to reduce the stigma that surrounds it. People, many people still feel, still feel that being, if they're lonely, it's their fault, mm -hmm. that there's something inadequate or flawed about them. I think it is, it's critical that we shift our focus on loneliness to see it as a signal. So just as thirst is a signal you need hydration, loneliness is a signal you need you need uh, human connection. We're not embarrassed or guilty or ashamed about being thirsty. Why do we apply that to loneliness? It's a social cultural construction. 
And it can get reconstructed in a way that we begin to see loneliness as the most human of feelings that signals a need for connection. And then we learn how to achieve the connections we need, how to recognize spiraling in toxic negative directions and manage that. And, you know, so and then I think the arts are one very powerful way to do it. There are other ways. I think being in nature alone mm, invites yes. a connection that's very large and, and um, connecting for people. I think that serving other people, volunteering, putting yourself aside, even for small periods of time to support and the the needs of others. I think that can be very connecting, but I think those, those two that both nature and serving others are best approached if you are really in touch with yourself. So you choose the, the, the ways to serve others that most relate to your own energies and your own ways to make a difference and contribute to the world. And the same thing with exploring nature. You know, what is it about nature that matters to you? Is it the vastness of it? Is it the detailed nature of it? Is it the, is it the ever ongoing presence of it? You know, so that you can, you can get the most out of those other ways to connect. And that's, you know, the likely experience you'll have by being out of nature of getting awe of being awed by your environment. I mean, you know, these days you can be odd, but although less and less by going to a really incredible movie, et cetera, but it's really the nature part. And we made a big push two years ago uh, for the and, and did, you know, online workshop about just getting people outside. Uh, this notion of Shon Ruku from uh, Japan forest bathing, I mean, has they've demonstrated, you know, some pretty significant improvements in measurable health parameters based on just getting people out into the forest and reconnecting them with the sights, the smells, the sounds of nature. There's no question in my mind, that's a powerful reconnecting force. And, and I, you know, whether it's forest bathing or just, you know, um, uh, giving yourself the permission to go for long walks on the beach without, without um, any tasks in mind, except to just fully experience that. I think this can and be. And leaving your phone at home. Or turning <laughs> off. And leaving your phone at home. You know, that's uh, one thing I, I observe, and it's it's a bit uh, challenging to me to understand why people are, are, are having these beautiful walks on the beach, but earbuds in, talking to people, moving their hands and having, you know, obviously challenging conversations. You're missing out on the potential of awe and nature connection in general. I think that's right. And I also think that we find awe where we find it. Right. So nature can be one place. I just have to share with you that the experience of writing this book, which took um, almost three and a half years, it was through the pandemic, um, changed my mind in some ways. I'm just beginning to understand. And one of those is I am now finding if I can walk through crowds, which used to drive me crazy, but with a certain pace and a certain way of paying attention, I just had this experience today coming through LaGuardia Airport. I found, you know, seeing the people, really trying to see them, even though I don't try to talk to them, and imagining, you know, the depth and complexity of their lives and the richness oh, of their totally, lives. I totally hear you, 100%. And I found it an awe experience to be walking through LaGuardia Airport. I never would have had that experience when I was a road warrior three and a half years ago. Yeah, I remember post 9-11 coming down an escalator. I can't remember. I think it was probably Dallas Airport. And um, there was a woman running a kiosk, whatever, with a scarf on her head. And I felt myself respond negatively to that individual based upon you know, my programming and I stopped and, and I, I just couldn't understand what that was all about. And like you said, she has her life. She's trying to figure it out. And I stopped and went over and chatted and, uh, and it was, it was very important how we can fan the flames of prejudice within our perceptions of others. And what you just said about walking through LaGuardia airport, I hear, I hear you loud and clear. And to your earlier question, and really kind of important comment about the complexity of the world, the challenges we're facing. I don't know all the ways we get there, but if we can get to a time when we actually find the people in the world around us awe inspiring in the same way wow. trees and the walk in the book, think Two of the changes that would be. Here. Yeah. So when I, it's kind of a technical question, but uh, I'd like to know, I'm, I'm not sure how much our audience would be thrilled by this, but is there a correlation that you're able to observe in looking at levels of loneliness 
and fMRI imaging. So again, I'm not a, a neuroimager, so I don't know that at a detailed level, but to, I, I don't think we've fully located the loneliness complex in the brain. We know we have the social cognition complex, the social cognition connectome, but it's very hard because to, to actually like, you know, there was a report about five years ago that came out that science, neuroscientists at MIT had found the, the part of the rat brain that was that made them lonely. <laughs> this is cracking up. It said, I can understand how you can isolate a rat and find its isolation center, but I don't know how you can ask a rat to share its loneliness um, feelings with you. So I think there's still a little confusion in the neurophysiologic world, you know, around that. Now, I, I still think we can learn a lot about studying neuro effects of isolation because there is a correlation, but it's not the same. And I think we can equally find out um, things about how the brain works to go the other way and give people awe, awe experiences and map their brain or um, music, intensive music enjoyment and map their brain. And I, I think we will be seeing those studies. There are many people calling for them and, you know, obviously doing careful, um, high quality science takes resources. And so it takes a while for that. That's where I have so much admiration for the work Susan McSamon and your art on brain is, is already having in terms of recognizing how much we all have to benefit if we have a better scientific understanding at the art of the arts and, and neuroactivity and neuroaesthetics. And I think it's, I think it's already starting to accelerate. Well, I think back of the uh, early work of Robert Sapolsky uh, look, showing that in primates, early life stress does, uh, especially threatening, which I guess by definition would be stress uh, events, uh, tend to actually impart changes in the hippocampus with neuronal dropout tending to favor isolation-like uh, behavior in that animal moving forward as it matures. So, you know, I think the, the good news is, I think what your book really plays upon is the notion of neuroplasticity that we can uh, rewire uh, consciously based upon the interactions, interventions that you describe, like art, like creative art. We can absolutely rewire and really get a second chance at uh, being able to interact with our world and with others in a way that we that might be threatening to us now but uh you know paint a, a, a brighter future yeah and i think it's also very exciting that there are emerging technologies that can amp amplify and potentiate those effects so a lot of my work in public health has been using digital technologies in more conventional ways right electronic health records remote monitoring in patients home i spent quite a bit of time you know trying to leverage those technologies for qu chronic illness management. But it's really clear that using um, virtual reality, for instance, can intensify uh, sensory input, intensify and focus those experience experiences. We can use AI to personalize those experiences to someone's individual profiles that they get to direct. I mean, it's really, you know, um, very exciting where these technologies can go, but we can't lose track of the fact that it's to support the the human need for connection not to distract or entertain right because you can you can also use those technologies to just drive dopamine reward cycles but i don't think that that'll potentiate the changes that people really seek to have lives that are as um kind of healthy and well where there is you know, the experience of full integration into the world around us, the integration with other people, their ambitions, their fears, that you don't feel that you're separate from that, but that you're not only included in it, but supportive of it. And I think we can get there. Yeah. And I think it's clear that the chronic activation of those self-serving uh, immediate reward pathways might detract from what you're describing as the ultimate goal, the broader picture, the more prefrontal interaction type uh, uh, with others and with the world around us and with nature, et cetera. So, you know, it may very well be that those short-term gains that people seek uh, may be actually taking them off course. I think that's possible. And then if people also have certain backgrounds, as you mentioned, you know, um, from the Sapolsky work, you know, in early or ch adverse childhood events, which I write about in my book, you know, kind of training our brain to be cautious and fearful, you know, so people who have that orientation um, are eager to escape from the discomfort of that. And so distraction is always a risk. And yet, 
you know, we also want to use technologies not to distract, but to allow us to focus, you know, and again, that gets into neurodiversity and some other challenges many people have now with focusing. But I think we're really on the edge of understanding how to support people through that transition. And I think creative expression mm-hmm. it has earned its way into the therapeutic armamentarium. Well, Jeremy, um, I'm very uh, grateful to have connected with you today. I'm feeling less lonely. As am I. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> congratulations on this really wonderful book. And I am very, very hopeful that so many of our viewers are going to read your book because uh it really is a is a great uh, insight into, you know, I think what is really pervasive these days, and to some extent, uh, you know, the situation around us seems to to make it work worse. And yet, you know, you offer us some wonderful channels out, not the least of which is creative art. So thank you so much. Thank that's so kind of you, David. And even though Project on Lonely is in the title of the book, and I do talk about some of our work. It's really an invitation to design your own project on lonely. And my goal in writing the book is to demystify loneliness, point to things like creative expression that people can explore, to know that if they're lonely, it's not their fault. And it is a signal like thirst. And they have the creativity and the imagination to get what they need to be connected. I'm feeling really, feeling really good with this connection. Thank you. Me too. Thank you. Hope we get to see each other sometime soon. I look forward to that, David, and thanks for the important work you do bringing this information and knowledge out to the audiences that really benefit from it. My pleasure. Bye for now. Bye for now. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast today. I know I did. I know I learned a lot. I know I learned a lot from reading the book about just how important it is to be connected, the value of art in terms of our feelings of connectedness, the health implications of feeling unconnected, which are really so pervasive these days, and most importantly, as we learn from Dr. Noble, what we can do about it. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Thank you for joining me today on The Empowering Neurologist. We will be back soon. Bye for now. 